Hello, and welcome back to the Mechanochemistry Discussions. This seminar series is hosted by the NSF Center for Mechanical Control of Chemistry, or the CMCC. The goal of the seminar series is, as always, to bring the community together. Our seminars stream live on the third Thursday of every month at 10 a.m. Central and are available on our YouTube channel to watch anytime. If you've missed any of our previous speakers, please do go to the YouTube channel and check out Mechanochemistry Discussions for all of these presentations. We also have an excellent slate of speakers lined up for the next few months, and we hope that you will join us for all of them. Before we get started, a great big thanks to a few people, Dr. James Batiste, the Center Director, Jennifer Belsick, the Center's Administrative Coordinator, and two students without whom this seminar would not be possible, Quintarius Moore and Noah Sheehan. Thank you so much for joining us. Please do follow, uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Twitter. Quick guidelines, note that this seminar series is being recorded. Although it's streamed live, if you have questions, please do send them to our uh, Gmail account at cmccdiscussions at gmail.com or post them on YouTube and they will be propagated to the speaker to address after the presentation. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce today's speakers. First, Professor Petra Balash is a specialist in the field of material science, extractive metallurgy, and mineral processing. He's a member and former head of the Department of Mechanochemistry at the Institute of Geotechnics at the Slovak Academy of Sciences, a center of research in the field of mechanochemistry in Slovakia. Professor, Professor Balash is a member of various institutions, including the International Mechanochemical Association, the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry, and the Learned Society of Slovak Academy of Sciences. He's published hundreds of scientific papers, books, and book chapters, and obtained prizes from the Slovak Literary Foundation for his monographs, Extractive Metallurgy of Activated Minerals, and Mechanochemistry in Nanoscience and Minerals Engineering. Second, Dr. Mate Balash is a senior researcher at the Department of Mechanochemistry, the Institute of Geotechnics at the Slovak Academy of Sciences. His research interests span chemistry, material science, and environmental sciences. He's a recent winner of the Young Researcher of Slovak Academy of Sciences under 35 years competition, was chosen to be the scientist of the year in 2018 in the category Young Researcher, and was just this past year a finalist in the ESET Science Award competition in the category Exceptional Young Researcher. Dr. Mate Balash is also an editor, an editorial board member of the MDPI journal Molecules. Doctors Mate and Peter Balash will present jointly today as part of mechanochemistry discussions on the topic mechanochemistry for current energy and environmental demands, thermoelectrics, and waste treatment. We look forward to the presentation. Good morning. My name is Peter Balash, and I'm going with my son Matthew, Mathieu Balash, present the results on uh, mechanochemistry for current energy and environmental demands. Presentation is divided into two parts. Uh, one is as for thermoelectrics or so energy materials. It, it's my uh, business, and then Mathieu business is waste treatment. <clears throat> we are coming from Institute of Geotechnics, which is under the umbrella of Slovak Academy of Sciences. And we are located in Košice in Slovakia, which is second largest town uh, here in uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, I will show you talk outline here. So after short introduction about Institute and about the uh, Department of Mechanochemistry, especially, <clears throat> Uh, I will introduce my part, which is mechanochemistry for thermoelectrics. And there are four points. So one slide is devoted to concern for energy. Uh, then I will try to explain uh, the topic on bird view on thermoelectrics. There will be several slides. Then because all results were obtained in scaling uh, mode, so I will illustrate scaling possibility. And at the end of my presentation, I will uh, illustrate three examples of uh, thermoelectric materials prepared by our technology. Then I will give stage to Matej, 
and uh, he will be uh, talking about mechanochemistry for waste recycling. So after a state of art, he will illustrate uh, uh, various examples about uh, waste, uh, but uh, line is all the time here that milling is used to, to, to process such materials. And at the end is the results about uh, treatment of eggshell by me uh, me mechanochemistry. Uh, our institute was uh, based in 1954 at the beginning as commission for mining. And then from commission, we uh, were cabinet, laboratory, and finally in 1963, Institute of Mining was established. And uh, however, after depletion of ores and the metallurgical and mining activity, now we are Institute of Geotechnics. Uh, from let's say technical reasons, but uh, you will see uh, what with what we are doing now. We have <clears throat> five departments. Uh, this is uh, the first one is Department of uh, Geotechnics, then Department of Physical and Physicochemical Mineral Processing Methods, uh, which is let's say oriented on on all tasks about treatment of of uh, concentrate now or treatment of waste. Then we have also Department of Mineral Biotechnologies. It started to treat um, uh, bacteria from mining mine water. So they are working in this field. And we have also Department of the Environment and Hygiene in Mining Engineering. And last but not least is our department, which is uh, Department of Mechanochemistry. Uh, in the uh, 1970s, this department was established by Professor Clara Tkachova. Uh, uh, she was my uh, PhD supervisor. And at that time, when mining was live, so the focus was uh, oriented on mechanochemical processing of carbonates, especially, uh, especially magnesite or siderite, with which we are rich in uh, this part of Europe. Later heads, uh, it's me and uh, Zdenka Lukačova Buniakova and Marcela Himovičova, they are my PhD students. So overview of our department is here. So Marcela is uh, head, Ma Matthew is vice head, and this nice lady here, they are our PhD students. So we have at the moment uh, four ladies and one boy. And two of them, uh, Olhas Kurichina and Olena Porotko, are from uh, Kiev and uh, Lviv, which uh, is in uh, Ukraine. And then are co members of, of our department here. We, they act as a researchers. Well, <clears throat> everybody who is working with uh, mechanochemistry needs uh, their tools. Tools, our tools are mills. And we I uh, usually work with uh, mirrors of uh, European origin from fr fridge company, it's full pulverizate six, pulverizate seven. They are very effective and uh, we are able to work on the protective atmosphere. We are able to measure the inside pressure and temperature, etc. This I use for mechanochemical synthesis. It means to prepare the new substances. But we have also um, another mills. This is on the left side is a tritor from Nech company. Uh, it's a very interesting mill because it is scalable. And now uh, these sterling ball mills uh, working in horizontal mode, they have 50,000 liters of inner volume. So they are really in, in industry, mainly in mineral processing. And uh, last uh, but not least is this minister because we have uh, cooperation with uh, Cancer Research Institute and we are preparing nano suspension of uh, several particles, mainly minerals based on arsenic and we, prepare, we are preparing nano suspensions and these nano suspensions are tested for various uh, cancer cell lines. We have uh, uh, institute in Bratislava, and so we are cooperating qu quite successfully. 
Now, uh, uh, let me say more deeply about uh, what we are doing in our department, Department of Mechanochemistry. Recently, Matej wrote a very uh, specific paper which was published in Current Opinion in Green and Sustainable Chemistry, where he is describing uh, our activities here in Košice. Uh, at the moment, we have big project on uh, synthesis of uh, halcogenides, binary, ternary, quaternary, as well as on nanocomposites. And uh, after mechanochemical synthesis, these materials are tested. Uh, now we work with quaternary sulfides, and they were tested as uh, solvents for solar cells, as well as thermoelectrics. And three examples I, I will show you in my presentation. Uh, we also work on nanocomposite. Then activities uh, goes to oxides, uh, very frequently connected with lithium, which is important for batteries, as you know. And then we have several environmental issues. Uh, this will be Matej's uh, uh, topic. Uh, Matej is originally uh, organic chemist, so he has some presentation in organic mechanochemistry and in other fields. So if you look on, on this slide, very, very general. So uh, mechanochemistry has a, a very uh, nice application in different fields. And there is very successful uh, project uh, led by Dr. Colacino. Uh, it is uh, here, Mech Sust Int, which is co European cost action. And many of these organic and pharmaceutical aspects are studied under this project and uh, in my presentation uh, again i will uh, talk about advanced materials especially uh, energy materials and mati will speak about waste management um, now i am in the call of my presentation my topic so let me say a few words about uh, energy so uh, energy is one of the uh, most significant concerns in the 21st century. And we know that uh, 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 energy demand is growing. And uh, in connection with this, we need uh, new materials, develop new materials, and they uh, are concentrated or aimed for various aspects as energy generation, energy storage, energy conversion and energy harvesting. And energy harvesting, this is my topic here, where I will uh, you inform about thermoelectrics, which briefly are materials which turn a temperature gradient into a voltage or vice versa. Now, <clears throat> I will concentrate by, let's say, bird view on thermoelectrics. This is connected with one uh, gentleman. Uh, he is a uh, uh, German scientist, Thomas Sebeck, who in 1822 uh, discovered the effect which was named after him, so-called Sebeck effect. And the uh, Sebeck effect occurs when a junction of two different semiconductors is maintained at temperature uh, gradient, you can see on this picture, there is a gradient of temperature, allowing charge carriers to diffuse from the hot end to the uh, cold end. And as a result, a net charge builds up at the cold end and, and results in an induced potential that drives a current uh, uh, when connected in a circuit. And we can do by using um, electrons and or as a negative uh, carriers or positive carriers, which are holes. So, uh, of course, in uh, technology, you need to work with thermoelectric module. And thermoelectric module is a combination of several tens of thermoelectric couples. So they consist from large number of, of these couples. And there is the combination of N-type uh, semiconductors containing free electrons and P-type semiconductors, 
which contain uh, free holes. And these form so-called legs, which are wired electrically in series and thermally in parallel. Uh, question is why thermoelectrics? So uh, recently thermoelectric devices have attracted extensive interest for because they have some unique feature. First of all, they are high reliable. They have a low impact on uh, environment. They operate in a quiet move, uh, mode and they have no moving parts. And as an example, here is a car, uh, because you know that car is producer of uh, waste heat. In this blue part, temperature uh, can be several hundreds of kelvins. And if we uh, put here a thermoelectric generator, this is number three, so we can, according to SEBEC coefficient, we can create electricity and electricity is used to power parts of car which needs electricity. So this is one application. The second one which is steadily used is uh, power generation in telecommunication. For example, to produce the electric uh, electricity in remote areas, also in weather station and uh, a very interesting uh, application in is in space to power satellites or deep space probes. Uh, and the trick is here that we have two sources uh, and difference of temperature is uh, between radioisotope, which uh, emanate uh, temperature and surface, for example, of Mars, where temperature is very low. So in principle, there is all the time difference in uh, temperature and can be used to, to, to supply uh, machines. Uh, last picture on, uh, on this uh, set of uh, figures in bird view of thermoelectrics. Of course, we need um, to look on efficiency of thermoelectric materials. And uh, uh, we use parameter which is called figure of merit. ZT, and uh, this uh, is uh, describing quality of material and was uh, first paper published on, on this parameter and this formula was published by Abraham Joffe in 1957. And if you look on, on first side here, so if you need high ZT, you need uh, both SEBEC coefficient and electric electrical conductivity must be large. And while thermal conductivity, this green uh, uh, green color must be low. Well, uh, uh, this is not so simple because laws of physics conspire against satisfying this requirement. And uh, first is so-called uh, wiedemann franz law which says that uh, there is a relation which relate uh, so-called uh, electronic thermal conductivity uh, that this uh, parameter to be proportional to electrical conductivity. So if you increase this parameter also the, the second one will increase. So they are going uh, they are going against. And then we have another problem. Uh, this is so-called Pisarenko relation or Pisarenko uh, limit that uh, the simultaneous uh, enlargement of SEBEC coefficient and electrical conductivity. So uh, the problem is they, uh, that these parameters are, are not separate and interact each other. However, we have one good thing that this thermal conduct conductivity is composed from two terms, from electronic thermal conductivity and lattice thermal conductivity, kappa E and kappa L. And this kappa L is very sensitive to uh, nano size of particles. And we know that in our size, in, in mechanochemistry, we can go to nano nano dimensions, uh, roughly speaking, and 
this opens door, doors for mechanochemistry to, to prepare such type of materials. So this is the last picture on bird view on thermoelectrics. But uh, because I said several times that uh, there is possibility and importance to scale the, scale the synthesis, now I will show you uh, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, one more, one more, one more remark. So, uh, how is current situation? So, all these thermoelectric uh, modules are composed on from alloys of lead tellurium and bismuth tellurium, this uh, halcogenides. Although widely used, they have a number of uh, disadvantages. Here are named two one. Uh, two, two of them. So uh, value of Z tail figure of merit decrease significantly at high temperature. So at high temperature, they don't work very well. And there is a problem with tellurium along because as for abundance, cost and toxic character of this element. In this table, I wanted to show you, for example, terrestrial abundance of these halcogenides. So if you compare sulfur with tellurium, so you see how big difference is uh, among these two, two elements. And of course, cost per kilogram in US dollar is also, uh, there is a big difference. L look here for sulfur, 0 0.15 or tellurium, $82. Uh, the problem is with uh, hazard also because while in sulfur you have some some small skin irritation, but if you are contact with tellurium, it's toxic and very harmful uh, in case of inhalation. So uh, there is uh, time for motivation. What to do next? And of course, we it is important to extend. A research for looking for high performance thermoelectric materials beyond tellurides using analogs which are earth abundant, low cost and less toxic. And in this case is a good space for copper based multinary sulfides, uh, which were synthesized uh, via me mechanochemistry and they overcome this dimension obstacles and offer great scalability potential. In this moment, I'm switching to scaling possibility. Here you see a demonstration unit of a large mill and principle of action. This is so-called eccentric vibration mill and this represent uh, industrially successful alternative to the vibration mill. Vibration mills are commonly used in industry, but this is something different. Uh, the mill has a modular uh, design. On the left side, you see half module, but in industry, there is six modules combined together, uh, in which exciter uh, unit uh, consisting of bearing blocks and unbalanced masses are connected to the motor by means of the, of the drive shaft. On the left side, you can see it. And uh, the mill works a little bit in eccentric mode. So if you have dry motor on the left side, so you need some counterweight because it is not totally balanced, but you need some, some difference to obtain good results. As for, um, as for, uh, balls, for example, here are grinding balls which uh, fill uh, about 80% of inner volume of grinding tube. And uh, it's, it's several hundred kilograms uh, to, to perform experiments. Uh, now question is if we worked with uh, such uh, equipment. Yes, we worked, but a little bit uh, adapted manner. Uh, we had project with the German university and we processed uh, our samples several times. So uh, we use concept so-called satellite mode. 
uh, on left side in blue side you see this eccentric vibration mill and on the top from the left side is something mounted which we call satellite satellite is uh, let's say it's another small mill open satellite is, is down it has a uh, five liter inner volume and uh, we you work with 80 percent of balls tungsten carbide balls with diameter we work with diameter 35 millimeters and total mass 30 kilograms and again filling was 80 percent and now the trick is that movement and all science behind big mill is the same like in case of uh, satellite so if we work with satellite under mounted on, on this of course there is a need to work under protective atmosphere you see these parts on left side because it's very strong milling so um, we obtain the same results amplitude of this mill is uh, uh, 20 millimeters and I have to say this is one of the main uh, technological advance because in vibration mills this amplitude is up to 12 millimeters so this is more intensive and uh, what is another way is that if you apply normal vibration mill you apply only uh, circular motion of the mill chamber in our case there is a combination of elliptical circular and linear vibration and all of these effects uh, all together give uh, rise to to results uh, in our experiments we used uh, 100 gram of precursors uh, which were milled in this uh, satellite of course, uh, in principle, there is possible to work with, uh, uh, I think, up to five, five kilo in one batch uh, experiments, batch mode experiments. And of course, we, we play also with milling time, which, uh, depends, which depends on system under study. But usually we, we didn't work more than two or three hours. It was enough to prepare uh, a new material. And now at the end of my presentation, I will show you three examples of thermoelectric materials. The first one is chalcopyrite. Chalcopyrite is a, a very uh, known source of copper. Uh, my PhD work was on, uh, on leaching or hydrometallurgical treatment of chalcopyrite under mechanical activation. But in this case, it's a, another story because uh, it's a quite interesting n-type material. N-type, you see, said the coefficient is here uh, negative. And uh, if you look on these uh, plots, which are needed for for a figure of merit calculation, electrical resistivity, Sebeck coefficient, the thermal conductivity, finally you can see these Zt values, and in principle. Uh, ZT values for industrial mill are higher uh, in comparison with laboratory mill. Of course, um, there is a lot of work how to improve uh, figure of merit. It is done by so-called doping, etc. But I wanted to show you principle of, of, of this. Uh, the second uh, very interesting uh, um, material is tetrahedrite, which is copper antimony and sulfur uh, and sulfur in nature it has also silver and in 2012 it was found in J by uh, japanese professor that this is very good material for thermoelectrics because in this uh, figure of merit values of uh, uh, conduct thermal conductivity are very low if it is very low so that take could be high and we process in in several uh, several uh, modes and publish it but you you can see here such a table with uh, experiments which the samples were designed as telu and in principle again if you look on zt so the values for telu 3 
and TELU4 are the best one, and TELU3 and TELU4 in this table are all the time connected with industrial milling. So uh, results, uh, we can say that uh, they are even better than uh, working in, uh, working in uh, lab laboratory mode. Uh, the last uh, last example is um, so-called quaternary sulfide, mafsonite. Name uh, a mineral was found in Australia, uh, and named after Antarctic researcher Mafson. And this is combination of four elements. In our case, all the time we work with not with uh, nature minerals. We all the time synthesize from elements. And at, uh, at uh, that time, uh, we, we had contact with Queen Mary University in London, and they worked uh, with mafsonite to prepare mafsonite in laboratory mill. And their results are in red one, red points. So again, if you go through electric con uh, conductivity, SEBEC power factor, which is uh, uh, from, from these parameters, thermal conductivity and especially lattice uh, thermal conductivity. And if you combine all these parameters into formula for figure you merit, figure of merit, so you can see that industrial mill has better results, like uh, in comparison with laboratory mill. What is very important from economical point of view is time of milling. Look here, in laboratory mill, they need 96 hours in comparison with our results, which was uh, the same results was obtained or even better results were obtained after uh, four, mil, uh, four hours. So um, the problem is not so simple because very frequently we have secondary phases in case of mafsonite, we uh, were fighting all the time this uh, so-called stanite, which is also a combination of these uh, four elements, but uh, in, uh, in other proportions. But we were lucky because uh, combination of, let's say, stanite, 10 or 20% with mafsonite, they is not harmful for thermoelectric properties. So it's OK. Uh, now I'm going to la last uh, last uh, picture, and I would like to conclude uh, in in three three points. So uh, perhaps uh, I, I wanted to show you that uh, simplicity and scalability of uh, of this uh, uh, mechanochemical approach is evident. We just take precautions and we prepare stoichiometric mixture of them. Then we put it into the mill. After milling, we open the pot. We separate balls from powders, and then, then we have powders to process. Of course, I, 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 had, uh, I did mention that powders must be consolidated, uh, which were done by spark plasma sintering methods to prepare tablets, etc. But in principle, we can prepare prospective thermoelectric materials. And well, this method is environmentally friendly and it is a one point, point synthesis. We don't need external heating, harmful liquid like in organic uh, chemistry or toxic gases because we are pre preventing to oxidation of sulfur. This is uh, one point. Um, well, I, I was trying to summarize these figures of merit for, for these three examples. And if you compare these results, so values for industrial milling um, are not bad. And I borrowed from uh, literature this sentence uh, by Dr. Lan. Uh, he said that in the not too distant, uh, distant uh, future thermoelectric devices could contribute to a renewable energy supply in the global marketplace, ensuring a future source of clean, reliable energy and protecting our planet to planet's environment. And at, uh, when we worked with this uh, mill, uh, I worked uh, under the umbrella of Professor Gok, uh, 
it's late now and uh, he started to apply these mills for mineral processing uh, procedures but then we slightly moved to prepare advanced materials and i wanted to show you results on thermoelectrics well uh, that's all from my side uh, from my side uh, now matej will come and if you have any questions please prepare it and at the end of his presentation i will be waiting for them thank you very much the stage is yours <laughs> okay uh hello everyone uh it's a big pleasure for me to continue the presentation after the person who inspired me in my scientific career so uh, it's a big opportunity also for me to show you uh some of the recent work i have been doing so um what i have been concentrating on since 2017 was summarizing studies on uh, mechanochemical treatment of various waste materials and uh, they can be uh, transformed into various uh, materials with uh, a lot of applications uh, i managed to publish a monograph in springer on this uh, as you can see uh, on the right side and uh, just this is like a big picture which with i would like to begin so on the left side you can see uh, really too much trash uh, in Košice. uh it's nearby our uh, house where we live so we can see maybe if we just uh, would a little bit investigate <laughs> what's there we could uh, we could transfer it by mechanochemistry to to uh, various materials uh, what was the motivation for me to concentrate on this topic? So uh, there are a lot of waste materials in general, uh, which can be uh, divided into three groups, uh, consumer waste, technogenic waste and uh, agricultural waste. Uh, here on this slide, you can see just in very short fashion, uh, the review papers that actually appeared uh, uh, on the treatment of various waste materials uh, by mechanochemistry. However, it can be that there is only very uh, small notice uh, on this, that ball milling can actually be used to recycle this material. These uh, papers which are in bold, uh, in that case, mechanochemistry was like the main focus. Uh, however, in general, these reviews were just concentrating uh, on uh, given waste. For example, for coal flyage, so there is a very well-known group of Professor Rakesh Kumar in India, and he has been working with this material for a very long time. So uh, there, are, there are nice reviews on the mechanical activation of flyage, for example. But uh, it was really, I had really hard time to find uh, like an overall picture where uh, different waste types would be covered. Uh, here on this, um, let's say orange and uh, violet uh, part, in this case, we can find some overlap between, for example, technogenic waste and consumer waste. Uh, but uh, I did uh, really not find like, uh, a work where all the um, works would be like uh, reviewed together. So this was the, the main uh, idea of this book. At the beginning, I thought it will be not so huge, uh, but at the end, uh, because the reviewer really helped me during uh, pre preparing it. So the scope uh, was really broadened and at the end, this book has more than 600 pages, so uh, it was really a four-year work for me, but I'm very happy that at the end uh, I managed to do it. So uh, here uh, we have different uh, waste materials. Again, uh, they are arranged. The numbers you see here are a number of studies. So uh, you can see that the three groups uh, we have, for example, uh 454 papers of technogenic waste in in the in the book reviewed this 1017 this is the overall number of studies which i included uh there uh and uh, i also chronology uh also in terms of chronology i, I try to put them um in the order how they appeared and uh 
I arranged those studies based on the type of waste into individual chapters in the book. So actually there are uh, 12 chapters, uh, 13 chapters, yeah. And uh, first is about mechanochemistry and then uh, each other chapter is like uh, the type of waste which was, which was used. Uh, here we have like an overview statistics with regards to the timing and uh, you can see as I think now everyone uh, tries to publish so maybe this is the general trend that the number of papers uh, increase each year for the given topic but uh, there are some fields that really we can observe exponential increase for example in the case of biomass uh, papers reporting on mechanochemical treatment of biomass so there have been really a huge amount of papers published as we approach the uh, 2020. Uh, so uh, this is like the book is also a little bit oriented on on statistics in terms of uh, the number of papers, etc. Uh, so provides an overview. Uh, another perspective that uh, that is included there uh, is based on the potential application of the recycled waste. So uh, as I told you, the book is arranged uh, according to the uh, waste itself. But uh, if anyone is interested for a given application, like for example, here on the left side, uh, I uh, put uh, like a print screen of one page of the, at the end of the book, there is an appendix where uh, the, all the 1017 1, papers are, are arranged based on the application. So for example, if anyone is interested into extraction from biomass, so he can easily see what kind of waste materials where can be used for it and where can he find the information about it. And on the right, uh, on this picture, we can see that uh, the most works uh, which are covered uh, are dealing with composite materials. But uh, there are also different like metals recovery, adsorption, and etc. Uh, okay, and here we see the overall number of papers published uh, on the on the on the topic of mechanochemical treatment of waste uh, with regards to the time. So uh, here we can clearly see the exponential increase. Uh, in the rest of my talk I will give you some overview on and examples about how uh, what kind of studies actually were uh, are included there so in this case this I selected like a nice uh, example that different waste types can be treated by mechanochemistry in, in one uh, system so for example uh, these Chinese authors uh, took waste plastics and milled it uh, together with rice husk and red mud, which both can be considered waste materials, and ended up with clean solid fuel cells. So uh, clearly uh, we have like, uh, this very nicely shows uh, how strong can mechanochemistry be for recycling even more waste materials. Um, the book is divided into three big parts. Uh, according to the type of types of waste. So in this picture, we can see uh, most of the consumer waste that uh, is covered in, in the book. And uh, even we can see the distribution into the individual chapters. So um, I'm sure most of you know, knows almost everything on this picture. Uh, so this is like just for uh, to give you an overview. Uh, from the electronic waste, uh, there was a nice uh, review paper written in 2015 uh, by Chinese colleagues who uh, summarized uh, the mechanochemical valorization of different types of waste, like for example, cathode ray tubes or batteries, etc. Uh, and uh, we can see usually uh, the result of this mechanochemical process was to recover uh, the valuable metals present in the uh, waste. Uh, and usually the authors made like a comparison with the traditional leaching procedure. So uh, at the end, usually they were quite successful. Uh, this is like a very big table, but I just want to show you this column 
uh, where we can see what is the extraction amount of the metals that were in the waste materials. And we can see it's uh, very often very close to 100%. So uh, usually mechanochemical treatment really helps to recover uh, the metal from the from the waste material which which contains it and the results are usually better than uh, when just classical leaching is performed. Uh, another example uh, here we have uh, wasted printed cir circuit board uh, which uh, is composed of three parts. Uh, we have metal of course which we can then extract we have some fiberglass and some resin and uh, due to milling as a result of uh, great homogenization uh, and the different properties of the three parts uh, at the end as can be seen in picture c uh, we can separate these three parts and uh, of course we can then recycle uh, each one of them so this is uh, this is a nice example of um, treatment of uh, electronic waste uh, then there is also another metallic waste, but it cannot be considered electronic because usually we are talking about some chips, for example, that are uh, produced upon the production of uh, products from magnesium, for example, aluminium during processing. Yes, when some components uh, of magnesium are being uh, prepared or also, for example, when uh, steel is uh, made, we also have uh, like uh, waste with a lot of iron. Uh, and this is just overview table to show you for what uh, the produce materials can be used. So we have just some metallic chips, for example, magnesium, and after mechanochemical treatment, we can efficiently use it for hydrogen storage operation. Uh, or we have some iron containing waste and because of the efficiency of milling procedure, we can transform it into some kind of iron oxide nanoparticles, which can be again applied uh, in, for example, for adsorption. Uh, another uh, group, or let's say it's like subgroup of metallic waste is aluminum waste. So here we can see, um, for example, in C, we have aluminum foil. Yeah, everybody knows it, works with it often and uh, in the work uh, which I am referen referencing here so the authors um, used aluminium that is present in this foil to uh, initiate the reaction with water actually so uh, and they have a, like combustion reaction you can see how the reaction front propagates with uh, very quickly so they overcame like a barrier uh, which usually uh, aluminium has uh, in reaction with water. So due to the effect of mechanochemistry, this was uh, the such a reaction was possible. Um, last uh, slide from consumer waste. So of course, polymeric waste or let's say plastic waste in general is a big environmental issue today. Uh, in, in the monograph, there are some notes about uh, scrap tire, uh, processing by mechanochemistry or some cable coverings. And uh, in this uh, work I am showing here, so uh, the authors were able to transform waste materials, plastic waste into products that can be used again. Uh, and you see ball milling procedure is one of more operations that uh, lead to this. Uh, one more slide from the consumer waste. So, automotive shredder residue is quite a big environmental problem because uh, it contains uh, chlorinated and brominated organic compounds and also heavy metals and if it is just stored like this on the picture so uh, they can easily of course pollute the environment so uh, the authors of the work uh, i am referencing they introduced uh, nanoscale calcium oxide uh, into by and they introduced it into the mill together with the uh, residues of this automotive shredder and um, what happened was that uh, this calcium oxide uh, like encapsulated the 
automotive shredder residue particles and as the result so there was uh, heavy metal uh, heavy metals were not leached out anymore and the chlorinated and brominated compounds decomposed this is also another big field in mechanochemistry mechanochemical dehalogenation so um, it's very effi efficient to use this procedure so in this case there were like two um, phenomena that were uh, happening at, at once and even this nanoscale calcium oxide was prepared uh, by mechanochemistry so the authors used two type two times the milling procedure uh, here is the overview picture about technogenic waste so most studies were devoted to the coal fly ash which is a, a byproduct uh, produced during coal combustion and uh, a lot of waste from metallurgy and uh, different types of uh, ash uh, so of, let's say a couple of words about uh, coal fly ash. so you can see it's like a nice powder with spherical particles however of course because of its composition so it possesses a threat to uh, the environment and as i mentioned at the beginning there uh, are a number of works by indian group which dealt with the mechanical activation of this uh, waste material which can lead into the process called geopolymerization <laughs> uh, but also uh, usually this produced material is very good for the cement production and in concrete industry uh, here is an uh, overview table about a uh, number of applications for which uh, fly ash, when it is uh, mechanically activated, uh, can be used for. So we have uh, composites for construction materials, or, or it can be even used as, as the grinding gate, or can be part of mortars. Um, this is uh, an example uh, from the work uh, about uh, treatment of fly ash, where the authors played with uh, different uh, milling parameters, like, uh, for example, uh, milling time or, or rotation speed uh, or a ball to powder ratio, which the authors played with it a little bit. Uh, and also, the surfactant quantity was changed here. And uh, as a result, they came up with different. Uh, fly ash like with different properties of course and they devoted the rest of the study to the proper characterization of the mechanochemical effects uh, another type of uh, technogenic waste is tailing so in this study the authors um, used tailing to for preparing a composite material where they investigated the mechanical properties and as we can see with the increased milling time uh, the compressive strength also increased so definitely we have like a positive effect of uh, mechanochemical treatment also here uh, another technogenic waste is sludge so it's like uh, waste when uh, the let's say the process uh, when it is formed is performed in liquid uh, phase and we have something like a, a little bit wet waste and uh, in this case, the authors managed to transform uh, it into the nanoparticles of uh, silicium, and even coating it with graphene uh, resulted in the materials useful for uh, lithium ion batteries. So this is another uh, nice example. Uh, another silicium based materials are, for example, silicon wafers or silica fumes. Uh, and uh, in the present study, so we can see in a set of experimental steps, uh, the authors synthesized like uh, active carbon uh, by using uh, like with the content of silicium, and this can be used uh, again uh, for the lithium ion batteries because silicon is uh, one of the mostly used. Uh, element in this uh, field. Um, the last part is devoted to agricultural waste. Uh, so there are two chapters, biomass and shells. 
So really, uh, this biomass chapter is uh, really robust. There is really a huge amount of various uh, biomass uh, which was used. So most abundant chapters are connected with the rice husk, wheat and rice straw, and sugar can by gas, for example. But you can find some really exotic uh, biomass that I never heard about before, and it actually uh, High energy ball milling can be used for efficient uh, rec re uh, recycling. And uh, with regards to shells, so this is my favorite topic because I have been working with eggshell for a long time. So, uh, of course, in addition to this, there are also another shells that I discovered that can be uh, transformed into valuable material. So, in this table, uh, we can see a different uh, biomass that can be. Uh, recycled. Uh, usually in this case, uh, we are talking about lignocellulosic materials that can be uh, hydrolyzed by uh, using uh, the effect of high energy ball milling. And at the end, we can have like simple sugars like glucose, for example. Uh, in some cases, the authors go even further and they uh, produce bioalcohol, for example, like bioethanol. Uh, mostly this is the main topic of the most papers devoted to, to this, but there are some another, um, also other uh, examples. For example, rice husk was used also as a source of silica, and again, nanoparticles uh, were prepared from it. Um, and now two examples. So a sugar can by gas uh, was treated by high energy ball milling process by using three different mills. Uh, like a vibration one, traditional ball mill, and centrifugal mill. And in this study, the authors uh, pursued how the result of enzymatic hydrolysis will be depending on the mill used. Uh, and another, uh, my favorite study is that we can see, show that uh, orange peels can be used as efficient uh, capping agents for the nanoparticles of titanium dioxide kept with uh, ruthenium also, and uh, they can be then used as uh, very efficient catalysts uh, of organic reaction. So again, biomass by the treatment of mechanochemic, uh, mechanochemistry can be transformed into useful material. Uh, so the last part of my presentation, I will devote to actual waste. So. Uh, in 2018, I summarized the um, works that were done in this field. And uh, last year, uh, together with uh, other colleagues, we provided like an update to this paper, but also uh, with regards to the um, more general picture, like applications in catalysis and pharmaceutical applications. In general, this waste material is still uh, very uh, strong in the number of papers that appear each year uh, by, uh, for its valorization. So uh, what is eggshell and eggshell membrane? This, when we say eggshell waste, we can say it's a combination of the two materials. Uh, here is nice uh, picture about the morphology. So uh, the eggshell is like a compact uh, structure of inorganic character with pores. But eggshell membrane is a fibro structure of organic origin, mostly composed of proteins. So if we see the chemical composition of eggshell, so we have 94% of calcium carbonate there uh, in the form of calcite and some another uh, uh, inorganic part. And uh, the eggshell membrane, on the other hand, is composed mainly of proteins. We have also collagens in there. And from this, uh, the application of actual membrane also in biomedicine or in medicine in general is used. So you can now buy actual membrane powder as uh, like a food additive that you can just take it because it will help you uh, with your uh, problems with joints, for example. Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, what we have done in 2015, we simply in were investigating the effect of uh, milling on the phase transformation in eggshell. So as I mentioned, um, eggshell is present in the form of calcite. So in the picture C, let's say, let's concentrate on it. So we can see uh, the 
black line is uh, actual non-treaty, then we can see calcite peak there. But after six hours of milling, we clearly see the phase transformation into aragonite. Uh, we really devoted a lot of time into this uh, investigation. Uh, we found out also that uh, such details, like, like for example, opening the milling chamber can really uh, impact on the outcome because when we opened the milling chamber and then continued milling, this transformation did not occur after six hours or was very, very small. But in this case, when we just left uh, the eggshell to be milled for six hours, we observed the amount of aragonite phase to be around 60%. So um, mechanochemistry is very, um, let's say, tricky sometimes, and all the details have to really be uh, investigated in, in detail. Uh, here is just another proof by selected area diffraction uh, that we actually transformed calcite into aragonite. So these red curves, uh, red rings correspond to, to aragonite phase. Uh, so we have used this milled eggshell for the adsorption of heavy metals. We selected cadmium and uh, silver. So uh, in the case of cadmium, you can see that the red line, which is only uh, the eggshell treated just for three minutes, and we observed more than twice uh, the adsorption ability towards cadmium increased and further processing just led to uh, really numerous increase in this ability. Uh, at the end, we ended up with uh, maximum sorption capacity of more than 300 milligrams per gram, which is a uh, really good value in comparison with the other biosorbents that are usually used for cadmium adsorption. With regards to silver, uh, there, there the process was not so efficient. However, again, after six hours of milling, we observed some increase of adsorption ability. We are thinking it's mainly connected with the presence of the aragonite phase. Uh, here we can see uh, that the uh, maximum sorption capacity is only 55 in comparison with uh, more than 300 in case of cadmium. Uh, another interesting application uh, is to use eggshell membrane as a source of sulfur because, as I mentioned, it's proteinal structure composed of amino acids and uh, there are a couple of sulfur containing amino acids like cysteine, for example, and the content of sulfur in eggshell membrane is about two or three percent. And in our experiment, we uh, just milled eggshell membrane with lead acetate, which was used as a lead precursor, and we were able to prepare lead sulfite. Uh, in about three hours, we started to observe uh, the peaks corresponding to galena lead sulfide in, uh, in the XRD patterns, and the uh, particles looks like this. So we, in our paper, call them like fish-like particles because they, they remind fish a little bit. Uh, of course, this was like a composite of lead sulfide and the residual organic matrix. So uh, for, in further work, it would be also good to like, get rid of this organic matrix, for example, by calcination, and then we would have uh, lead sulfide, uh, pure lead sulfide at the end. Uh, one of the last examples I would like to show you is the synthesis of silver nanoparticles by using uh, mechanochemistry. So we introduced a process called biomechanochemical synthesis, where we uh, performed a just solid state reaction between silver nitrate and actual membrane. And actual membrane is reducing agent. And here in the XRD patterns, you can see these green lines, they correspond to peaks of silver. So already after 15 minutes, we observed uh, like uh, the reflections corresponding to it, but then of course, with the time, as the time progressed, there was further increase uh, and quite nice nanoparticles well distributed in this organic matrix are found. And uh, we investigated uh, antibacterial activity against uh, different uh, bacteria. So for example, SA st stands for stress, uh, Staphylococcus aureus or EC is for E. coli. So, uh, here we can see that actually our powders were efficient antibacterial agents. Uh, now, uh, I think this is the last slide uh, before conclusion. So, um, 
we also, I mentioned the process of uh, mechanochemical dehalogenation, and we use this one uh, in, the, in this investigation. So uh, in the PVC waste, like window parapet, we have chlorine, of course, and it cannot be combusted in a regular way because uh, toxic dioxin uh, uh, would, would be formed. But if we uh, somehow get rid of the chlorine there, uh, it's uh, the environmental problem is much lower. So um, in our presentation or in our experiments, we uh, milled it together with eggshell and we observed the formation of calcium chloride. So this was like a, a chemical which can be used for drying, for example. So really the uh, environmental problem can be a little bit, at least a little bit solved by this approach. And we observed 100% dechlorination in laboratory experiment, but in the semi-industrial, in the same mill that uh, Peter was talking about in the first presentation, we observed 56%, uh, uh, but you can see again uh, this advantage, uh, which uh, is in terms of scalability in the process here. Uh, so in this study, we try to show that the mechanochemical processing of waste, uh, in, namely eggshell, can be uh, done also in a scalable manner. So actually by combining two waste materials, we could get something useful. Uh, okay, with, with this message, I'm coming to an end. So this is like final picture of my presentation. So I tried to uh, show you that really very, very various waste types can be transformed into, into useful materials. And of course, you are more than welcome to check the monograph if you find it interesting. Uh, however, I, I cannot conclude without uh, mentioning uh, other colleagues because uh, the Department of Mechanochemistry in Pushica is not just us with Peter, but we have also other colleagues who uh, each of them work on, on different topics, uh, as, as you can see here. And of course, uh, the work of PhD students who um, help uh, to bring, let's say, more energy to. I am not old yet, but uh, anyway, we need uh, new energy from from youngsters. Uh, and at this point, I need to mention my two PhD students who were working with me on the projects that I uh, was talking about here. So Maria Kovacova and Martin Stahorsky. And uh, Peter already mentioned this uh, cost action, European cost action that we have, uh, mechanochemistry for sustainable industry. So uh, all together, but mainly the work of the action chair, Evelina Colacino, is really much appreciated because it helps whole uh, community to move forward. And uh, really the project is focused more on organic chemistry. I gave you more overview of technological viewpoint, I think, but I think in general, we are all mechanochemists and uh, it's really good that we can share knowledge also, also within this platform. Oh, okay, so this is all from me. Thank you very much. Uh, and now, if you have any questions, we will be more than happy at least try to, to answer them. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. So we have questions for both of you, but I guess, Mate, since you're here in front of the microphone, we'll, we'll start with you. Okay. Uh, here's the first question is, for processing waste, even if it's just one type of product, how can one control variations from item to item? For example, light bulbs from different manufacturers, especially since the exact composition of commercial product materials is not known. Uh, yes, uh, this, is, this is the general problem uh, of uh, treatment of complex materials in mechanochemistry. So also when I worked, for example, with plants, there is also a set of compounds that uh, really we don't know which compound is uh, responsible for the effect of reduction, for example. So in this case, uh, it would need much more, let's say, characterization study of the waste uh, at the beginning if we want to go into more details. But as you could see, uh, these studies I have been talking about are more devoted to the technological side. So uh, it's not a lot of science behind, let's say, it's more like technology that actually this process is, is feasible. I think this might do. Thank you. All right, next question. Organic synthesis typically relies on retrosynthetic methods to help predict and target products. In your work, have you found a similar methodology or thought process that could be applied to mechanochemical synthesis? Uh, well, this 
I think this question mainly, mostly is related uh, again to to something what I was talking about before that uh, we have really complex stuff when we are uh, dealing with waste. So it's I think maybe if we if we already have some some results so from some preliminary work then we can guess maybe uh, what would be the good steps to uh to do the experiments but when we start with completely new, uh, new project i think it's very difficult to guess however in terms of let's say inorganic synthesis like uh, peter was talking about i think in that case we can more or less guess what would be the products and nevertheless i think mechanochemistry always surprises us with something uh, usually the, the, the products, uh, even the ones that we did not expect at all, might uh, appear and that's that's science. Uh, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad, so we need to work more to get more information. Mechanochemistry is still very complex, I think. All right, let me uh, pick one more question for you before we move on. Uh, regarding the mechanochemistry of waste treatment, is this something that is primarily happening at the laboratory or research scale? Or is it something that is readily available at the industry scale? How much of waste management currently uses mechanochemistry? Uh, I think it's it's happening on the uh, industrial scale also, uh, because in more in, 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 in more of the in more of the systems or also in the studies. They are also the parts like feasibility study or some economical considerations that can easily uh, sh that easily show uh, that it's applicable in uh, in industry. Uh, moreover, for example, just with actual waste, I know about one or two uh, companies here in Slovakia who use mills to process it because one company, for example, produces um, uh, pills of calcium, yeah, rich in calcium uh made from eggshell and of course they need to do it really homogeneous like to have it like a normal pill but uh, as it's known uh, these companies usually they protect their knowledge yeah by patents and like this so uh of course we as scientists cannot see it uh, directly but uh personally i have been to one company and i could see really nice mill which uh, works there, so I am absolutely sure uh, mechanochemistry is yet uh, industrially applied also for waste treatment. Great, thank you very much. Uh, maybe we can switch over to the to Peter for the first speaker and ask a couple questions. Okay, I'm here. <laughs> You're ready, okay. Um, so we're going back to the beginning of the presentation, but. For the third example of thermoelectric materials, you mentioned how the synthesis of mawsonite has a secondary phase stannite that is harmful to thermoelectric performance, not harmful to thermoelectric performance. Has there been any research in converting stannite to mawsonite through the use of heat or pressure to increase the yield of the thermoelectrically active material generated? Uh, <sighs> I didn't find I didn't find such work because I think thermodynamically this creation of stannite is uh, fa favorable. Uh, but I know that uh, when um, thermoelectric properties of stannite are studied separately, so these properties are not bad. So if you combine these two materials, um, it's not K four properties. Uh, we found uh, stannite also in other systems. It's always there, and it needs to optimize. It needs to optimize uh, milling conditions. I, I think when the milling conditions will be more mild, so we can um, manipulate with ratio of these two phases, uh, stannite and mafsonite. Thank you. Next question. I noticed, noticed that the Seebeck parameter varies non-monotonically with temperature for a couple of cases. Why is this, and could the behavior be leveraged to tune properties? Uh, it's a very hard question for me because <laughs> I'm, I am I am I am not specialist in, in this field. But generally speaking, this problem of Seebeck coefficient is uh, non-monotonous uh, procedure many times depends on uh, phase transformation in in uh, synthesized phase 
For example, there is a, a very nice paper uh, on kesterite, which is also quaternary sulfide, uh, with very strange, uh, with very strange uh, uh, behavior of Sebe coefficient. It's uh, Italian colleagues, and they found uh, finally that it is connected. These changes are connected with with uh, different phases transformation. In case of kesterite, there is a um, change from tetra tetrahedra to cubic phase. So this is special for, for, for the system under study. Thank you. All right, let's do one more. You demonstrated the effect of grinding on thermoelectrics with ZT less than one. Has this been tried with some of the leading ZT greater than one materials? And can the world-leading thermoelectrics be potentially improved in this way? Uh, yes, in principle, it's possible. But uh, I think it, now it's time to go to other types of uh, chalcogenides, and these are selenides. And uh, some type of selenides, let's say combination of tin with selenium in different ratios, so you can overcome um, figure of merit one, and you can go to very close to to two, which is excellent uh, from from the point of uh, from the point of uh, efficiency. But uh, these results were obtained by solid state synthesis, not not by mechanochemistry. So, for example, from this picture, Marcella is working with uh, with her PhD students on selenides, and she's. Uh, concentrated on these selenides, which uh, seemed to be very perspective, very stable. They have not problem with uh, elimination of sulfur. And uh, I think uh, they will be sec successful to prepare uh, them also in, in, in uh, scalable amounts. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, both of you, for your presentations. We really appreciate your participation in the mechanochemistry discussions. Yeah, thank you very much. We hope that we, we don't know uh, who was behind the scene, but we hope that we attracted people from mechanochemistry. And all our uh, message is that we are, we are very lucky uh, that uh, mechanochemistry is spreading so much. Just one. Uh, uh, one remark, when I started to work in this field, there were one or two gentlemen in the United States, for example, who were working with mechanochemistry. Now, there are many groups of them, so we are, we are lucky. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you again. Mate Balash for that outstanding presentation. And thank you all so much for joining us. If you missed any of the previous speakers as part of mechanochemistry discussions, I encourage you to check them all out on our YouTube channel. And stay tuned for the upcoming months. We have several excellent speakers lined up. We look forward to having you join us for all of them. Thank you again.